Now, I did have a couple of people say to me, can't you just be happy with what you have? And it was such a slap in the face because that's not where I was coming from at all. And like I just tried to explain, it was like, no, I'm so happy with what I have. That's why I want to do it again. You're ready to have another baby and you're imagining the memories that your family will make together, but it's just not happening. Secondary infertility or the inability to have another child after previously giving birth is more common than primary infertility or the inability to not have any kids. And it's full of many misconceptions. Here to discuss causes, coping, and moving forward with secondary infertility is journalist, co-founder of Fertility Rally, and host of the Infertile AF podcast, Allison Prado. Allie, welcome to Baby or Bust. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Secondary infertility is something that's a little bit near and dear to you. I went through it, although I had never even heard of it until I was in the thick of it. It is not something that a lot of people feel comfortable talking about. I think that's one of the most common things that people with secondary infertility share is a little bit of shame, whether it's internal, like, oh, I should just be happy with what I have. Or even if it's external, they're sharing with loved ones, friends, that they're struggling and they're kind of like, well, shouldn't you be happy? You already have a child. A hundred percent. That happened to me. Yes. I had my daughter with no fertility issues. Thankfully I had her, I got pregnant when I was 34 and I gave birth when I was 35. My husband and I had recently moved to New York from a long time in Chicago. We didn't really know anybody here. So we put off having kids, even though we had been married for over a decade at this point. We didn't feel comfortable having kids early on in New York because we like didn't even know how to ride the subway. So I'm like, we can't bring a baby (laughs) into this world. Like I don't even know where we're going. Point being, had we stayed in Chicago and not moved to New York, I think we would have started having kids earlier. And I never would have probably found myself in the secondary infertility situation. But since we started later, And then since I had no real issues, thankfully, getting pregnant with my daughter, I did have placenta previa and she was breached when I was pregnant with her, but that doesn't have anything to do with infertility per se. It was not until I was about 37 or 38 that we started trying for our second kid. We always knew we wanted a second kid. I didn't know anything about my fertility. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about egg quality. I didn't know anything about how as you got older, things changed and how it was harder as you got older. I was looking to... Hollywood kind of and seeing like, oh, Halle Berry just had a baby at 41, like Janet Jackson got pregnant at 50, you know, things like that. Because those were the messages that were being portrayed at the time. Now, granted, this was eight years ago now. Mm -hmm. So a lot has changed since then. People are a lot more transparent about their stories and their difficulties, thanks in part to you being on social media and your podcast and other things that are out there as well. When did you first think, oh, maybe this is going to be a little bit different from the first time? Well, after I had four miscarriages. (laughs) So we started to try when my daughter was about two and a half and I got pregnant pretty easily and then had a very early miscarriage. And I, after the first one, I was kind of like, okay, this is par for the course. Then I had another one not long after that. And I was like, hmm, this is not seeming good, but we'll keep trying. And then when I had the third one, I was like, okay, something's going on here. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth one finally prompted me to go see an RE. That was the point where I was diagnosed with secondary infertility. And that can be actually a confusing definition for people. So Mm -hmm. you think to yourself, oh, well, I'm getting pregnant. I'm not Mm -hmm. infertile. Like Mm -hmm. I can get pregnant. Why do I even need to see a fertility doctor about this or kind of look into things. I'm miscarrying. Yes, you're getting pregnant, but you're not having another baby. And Mm -hmm. that is a form of infertility. I started getting very depressed. My relationship, my husband at the time, or I mean, he's still my husband now, my husband. (laughs) But at the time he thought, kind of like you were saying in the intro, like, we're good. We've got ever our daughter. Why are we going through this? You're heartbroken. Why are you putting yourself through this heartbreak. And that was a very big part of my story was that he and I just were not really on the same page about it. And I could not not want it. I like wanted another child so badly. And I think that's part of the secondary infertility thing that's hard for people to understand if they haven't been through it themselves is that it's not about being greedy or it's not about not being happy with what you have. 
the way that I try to explain it is that I was so happy being a mom. It was my favorite thing. And I surprised myself even because like I always knew I wanted to have kids, but I didn't realize I would love being a mom so, so much that I wanted to do it again. I wanted more of that experience. And yeah. one just didn't seem like enough coming from a place of love, not a place of greed. Hey, nobody can tell you when your family is complete and let's talk about all the options. And people will say things. And, you know, I did have a couple of people say to me, can't you just be happy with what you have? And it was such a slap in the face because that's not where I was coming from at all. And like I just tried to explain, it was like, no, I'm so happy with what I have. That's why I want to do it again. It is a hard thing to explain to people who aren't going through it. And I can see the disconnect there. I get it. I can see it kind of from both sides. Sometimes there's a feeling of responsibility to provide a sibling to the child that you already have. A lot of people have grown up with a big family and sort of really appreciated having those brothers or sisters kind of growing up and having that shared experience. Like nobody else is going to have your exact same mom and dad or family childhood experience. And or the kids themselves are getting old enough to say, hey, I want a baby brother for Christmas or mm -hmm. I want a baby sister for my birthday. And it's just like daggers, you know, Nothing. to the heart if you do too. Yeah. And you're trying your best. Absolutely. That's yeah, that did happen to me was that, you know, ever was getting older and she knew that because we'd been talking about having another baby. And I think I'd even told her maybe one or two of the times that we were pregnant early on. And then she was too little to understand what happened that I had miscarried. But I was like, what about the baby you said? Mm -hmm. You know, and that just makes you feel so shitty because you're like, I'm <laughs> trying so hard. But yes, like you said, I come from a very big family. You know, my mom was one of five. My dad was one of seven. I have tons of cousins mm -hmm. and aunts and uncles. And I love that family chaos. I love going into like a family event and there's just millions of people. And my husband is an only child of two only children. So hmm. he had the opposite upbringing where he didn't have that many relatives. So it's kind of not his fault, but he was just like, I don't know what that's like. I don't crave it like you crave it. We just were not seeing eye to eye. And there was a point where I was like, are we going to get divorced over this? Oh, because gosh. we are not moving in the same direction. And it got pretty dark. We had to have some really deep heart cracking open talks because I was like, I can't. And I remember saying to him, I wish I didn't want this so badly because it would be so much easier. But I can't deny this desire and this feeling. And I have to keep going. We have to keep trying. And that's yeah. what we did. You don't know anything about me. Like, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Like, it, it can be very hurtful, the things that people say. And they mean well most of the mm -hmm. time. You know, it's not coming from a malicious place. But it does just really trigger if you're in the thick of this, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The question started at my daughter's first birthday party. There you I go. really struggled to have her. And I was uh -huh. just glowing in the fact that I was finally a mom and so happy to have a first birthday party. Mm -hmm. And yep, just a couple of the moms just like kind of standing around watching the kids play like, OK, when are you going to start trying again? I was like, oh, can't I just enjoy this for a right. little bit? And did you say that or like, did you have an answer? Oh, gosh. I think that's a good thing yeah. to try to put out there and to people that might be listening is like, what do you say? I just basically blew it off. I was like, oh, let me go get the cake. Time to blow out the candle or exactly. whatever. Because exactly. I just didn't know. And it was yeah. a new experience for me. And I think that's one of the reasons that I do a lot of education on social media about yeah. awkward fertility conversations because I've had so many and I wish I knew what to say. Mm -hmm. At that point, and I think about it in different categories, you can just totally deflect. That was my baseline. Like, mm -hmm. oh, how about that, you know, Laker game last week? Or, right. oh, didn't you guys just come back from a vacation? You know, I just right, totally exactly. deflect and ask something about them. And then you can do the second category is like just getting real honest and being really vulnerable and be like, you know, we are trying or we have had mm -hmm. a miscarriage and I don't really feel like talking about it right now at the birthday party, but like I would flip flop, though, like sometimes I would I was like, it's so exhausting to get into the whole thing. So I would like you said, just kind of be like, we're trying or like, def you know, be like, hey, how about those bears? You know, whatever <laughs> deflect. But sometimes I would be like, you know what? Actually, if you really want to know, I've had four losses and, you know, and then people are just like, but sometimes I would say that and then they'd be like, oh my God, so did I, or so did my sister. Let me get her, you know? And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. people start coming out of the woodwork and you're like, why is no one talking about this? Why did it take an awkward moment for you to like, 
confess to me that you've gone through this too. I think one thing that is really hard about secondary infertility is if you really do imagine your family a certain way and it's not happening that way, the siblings keep getting further and further apart. Mm-hmm. My mom always talked about how hard it was that she and her sister were four years apart. Mm-hmm. And so the closer and closer I got to that due date being like past three years or whatever 100%. it was, the more and more anxious I got that they weren't going to get along. And it was this outside pressure or the mm-hmm. societal pressure like, oh, they should always be two years apart. Like, where did that mm-hmm. even come from? And I just imagine yeah. that that was actually pretty heightened for you. When you do have a loss and you had that due date in mind, like say the baby was going to be born in June and then you have a friend or someone that you know who didn't have a loss, every single time you see that baby, you think, oh, that would have been my kid. My kid would have been going to kindergarten this year. My kid would have been going to first grade Mm -hmm. this year. My kid would have been learning how to ride a bike. So that's Mm -hmm. these constant reminders of all anybody who's had a loss, I think can relate to that is like what would have been and grieving what could have been and the life that you could have had, that's a really big piece of it that I feel like people don't talk about enough. That is a real grief, the loss of what might have been, the way your your life might have looked. We did one transfer, a frozen embryo transfer, and it worked, and I had my son. I give myself the chills, which sounds so <laughs> I, I am feeling them. Because, but like, I feel yeah. I'm still, and I say this too, like, Every single day I look at him and I'm like, I still can't believe you're here. I say that to him. And he started saying recently, I'm always here because now he's kind of like needs a response. But I still can't believe it. I Like oh. what? The odds were so low that it was going to work, you know? Oh, I mean, you probably know the odds better than me, but. No, it's like 30, I mean, 30%. I think it's beautiful. I do have so many patients that maybe they do just have one euploid or chromosomally balanced embryo. And they almost like give up like right then, like, oh my gosh, I only have one Mm -hmm. chance. Like this is just not going to work. And I appreciate your letting us know that you did do therapy and that you did really work through and almost like it sounded to me like you surrendered a little bit to what you could control and what Mm -hmm. you couldn't control. I was laser focused on having the second baby. And in retrospect, I do realize it it was taking so much time and energy, emotional energy, not necessarily time away from my daughter because she was still like little enough that, you know, I was still with her every moment, but maybe mentally I wasn't there because I was always longing for something else. So yes. And and there's guilt involved. A lot of people have reached out to me either via my podcast or fertility rally, or just emailed me or DM'd me and said, did I miss the window? Mm -hmm. You know, that now they're going to be four years apart. Now they're going to be five years apart. And I don't want that. I never wanted that. My kids are six and a half years apart, which is a big gap. Mm -hmm. School-wise, they're seven. My daughter's in eighth and my son's in first. So that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. I kind of see it as there's pros and cons. One of the pros, I will say, for anybody that might be contending with such a large age gap is that my daughter was old enough to watch the baby so I could take a shower <laughs> when Amazing. he was a newborn, which is like a big luxury. <laughs> so I could be like, could you just sit on the couch? You know, he's in the crib or whatever and just come in if you, you know, so stuff like that where like they can help out. And now that they're older, you know, she's 13 and he just turned seven. So she can babysit for him. We can go out for dinner. Yeah. That's pretty cool. We don't have to pay Very. her. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so things like that, not to make light of it, because it is people get bummed out that it's not the age difference that they were hoping for. But I also kind of feel like that's just something you can't control. I still feel so lucky to have both of them. But it is challenging, too. And on the pond side, I would say, like, they don't like to do really a lot of the same things. So we find ourselves spending a lot of time with the little one because she's off with her friends now. And, Mm -hmm. you know, somebody on Instagram actually was like, well, we can tell you like your son better than you like your daughter because (gasps) you're putting more pictures of him on social media. And I was kind of like, why would you say that, first of all? (laughs) And secondly, like, she doesn't want me to post pictures of her now. The reason she's not on my social media is because she's got her own thing. And yeah, he still thinks it's kind of cool. So he still lets me take pictures of him. But that was kind of hurtful or like a weird comment. I think it's important for people to realize that all the same things that can cause primary infertility, which means not having a child ever, can absolutely come into play with secondary infertility. Then there's also some other unique things 
it's really important to get an evaluation like any time. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have to wait a certain amount, but certainly if you're over 35 and you've been trying for six months, get an evaluation. If you're Mm -hmm. under 35, you could wait for a year, but I don't think there's any reason to wait. I had someone who had a really uncomplicated C-section to deliver their first baby and really delayed coming to see me. It was just not getting pregnant, not getting pregnant. And she had significant scarring and her tubes were blocked. And so Mm -hmm. if she hadn't come and let's just kind of figure these things out, she could have kept trying. The one thing that is really different, and you spoke to this, is you are older when you are trying for your second child. Mm -hmm. That's just time. Right. <laughs> it's just it's a just fact. It is. Right. Exactly. And there are fewer good eggs or fewer good sperm. You know, it's right. not just a, you know, person with ovaries issue. And yep. so the sooner you can find out if there's any issue, I just really think the better. Absolutely. The yeah. assumption that I always had early in my career of helping people with fertility treatments is I would just imagine that people with, who've never had a baby before would be more stressed out be more nervous about this or more fearful that they would never be a parent. Mm -hmm. And I would say people coming back for their siblings, they at least have that reassurance that they can have a baby physically. Mm -hmm. But oh my, people with secondary infertility are just as worried, need just as much support, need just as much, whether that's therapy or Mm self-care, meditation, mindfulness, whatever it is, they just can't ignore that piece of it because they need it just as much as somebody who's never had a baby. I'm so glad you said that because I do think also, although there's, you know, different labels and secondary is different from primary, I always say, and this is just my personal belief, I feel like if you're having problems, it's not the pain Olympics. You know, it's not your situation's worse than mine. So I shouldn't be talking or sharing. Like I never want anyone to feel like they're not in like a dire enough situation. We're all having a hard road. If you're in pain, your pain is valid. It doesn't matter if it's secondary, primary, the third baby, the fourth. I just want to put that out there as my belief. Another assumption I've seen is that just like in primary infertility, like it's always got to be the female's fault, right? But just last week, Mm -hmm. I diagnosed a couple where the male partner, they have two kids together. They really like to add to their family. Mm -hmm. But the male partner did a semen analysis very reluctantly. You know, Mm -hmm. oh gosh, we've got two kids. There's nothing wrong. There's no issues completing the task, you know, just however you want to say it. There's just no way. And he had no sperm in his ejaculate. Wow. And guess what? Mm. He's taking testosterone. Okay. (laughs) You know, he's had low energy. He's kind of in his mid 40s and saw a doctor that was just like, hey, your testosterone levels are low. So this is going to make you feel so much better. Happened to not share that he was thinking about having another child in the future and just was not on his radar that actually taking testosterone can shut down or significantly lower sperm production. So just no assumptions call the doctor, make the appointment, get the second opinion. No one's going to advocate for you better than you because you know your own case and you know your own body. And if you feel like something's off, it probably is. You know, you know best how you feel. I didn't realize you could kind of ask questions and do your own research and bring stuff in. And pharmacy shop, which is another one where like, you don't have to go to the pharmacy that they're telling you to. Maybe there's a better one that all that stuff. So it's it's cool to know that you can advocate and get a better situation for whatever you're going through. If somebody comes to you with a list of like legit good questions, you wouldn't take that personally, right? I mean, no, I like you would embrace that. Often I learn and then I Also, or I'll be humble and say, gosh, you know, I honestly haven't read that study yet. Let me get back to you. Or I just sort of think to myself, I'm glad that they have taken the time to think about what is really important for them. What are their goals for this visit? And they're going to get more out of it if they've really thought about what questions they have. And I think it's so important too. And I know that you do this because I've talked to you many times before, but being a team with your doctor or your medical team, you know, feeling like a team player and not just the patient that's being dictated to, you know, feeling like you've all got some skin in the game. So you all want this to work out. Like that's a good feeling. And, you know, I've met so many people that don't have that. And I'm like, it doesn't have to be like that. I know sometimes it's not easy because you have to see the certain person because of insurance or whatever. But if you can get to a point where you feel like you're on the same team as your medical professionals, I think that's so important. 
Sometimes it takes a village. Sometimes that team can be your acupuncturist, your mm -hmm. registered dietitian or nutritionist, your therapist, your naturopath. It can be one of the nurses in the clinic that you can kind of pull aside sometimes and be like, mm -hmm. I really just don't understand what Dr. Smith just said. Right. You can find that team and that support system. And, and like you said, when you talked about just reaching out to people and finding out if you're vulnerable, they'll kind of share their stories mm -hmm. with you very mm -hmm. often, or you'll realize you have more in common. Mm -hmm. That should happen with your healthcare providers too. I guess one other point I wanted to make that you know has been on my mind recently is like, I never want anyone to feel less than when they have secondary infertility in the fertility world, because it's not primary and primary, you know, is first and gets all the attention and all that stuff. But I just don't want people to feel like they don't deserve great treatment or they don't deserve to have another kid. Or, you know, we had a, another just quick anecdote. We had a, a support group call and a lot of our members joke about, we call them like free babies or like sex babies, like people that don't need <laughs> assisted uh, reproductive technology yeah. to have. And it's like a joke. And somebody had mentioned like, oh, we don't like people that have free babies. And somebody who is going through secondary infertility private messaged me and was like, I feel like I should leave the call because you know, oh. I'm going through. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, please don't. I'm secondary too. Like we all belong here. You know, they didn't mean you. And but I think that that's kind of sometimes you're just fledgling when you're going through secondary because you're not sure where you fit in, whether it be on social media, if you feel like you can't take up enough space as somebody else because you already have a kid. Because yeah. there's so much pain in this community and people are going through so much and you never know what's going to trigger someone or hurt their feelings or make them feel left out. And we never want that to happen. Fertility rally is like a safe space and we want everyone to feel welcome there. And I know you're the same with your show and all the things that you do as well. So yeah, that's a great point. Oh, Allie, I really appreciate your being here today. Oh, I just love catching you. up with you. And well, thank you so much for having me. I love everything that you're doing and people can <laughs> find me. My podcast is called Infertile AF and it's on all the podcast places and on Instagram it's in for life stories and then fertility rally is a community where everybody's welcome no matter what they're going through we're at fertilityrally.com and on Instagram at fertility rally so come check us out I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ali Prado as much as I did it was a great reminder of just how important secondary infertility can be. It is never too soon to get an evaluation and advocate for your care. And just remember, you are not alone. Your story is just as important as anyone else's. I'm your host, Dr. Laura Shaheen, and this is Baby Your Best. Baby Your Best is produced by Mark Ramsey, Jamie Solis, and Greg Moga. Executive produced by Paul Anderson and Nick Pinella for Workhouse Media. Baby or Bust is a Mark Ramsey Media production.